following network. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Brewer's Studio. Thanks for coming to hang out with us. My name is Justin Crosley. I work for the Brewing Network, and uh, we stream beer radio all year long, interviewing guys like this. And we're streaming all this now, so you're on camera. You can say hi to mom and don't pick your nose or anything like that. Uh, if you're just standing outside the Brewer's Pavilion, come on inside. There's no lines. Uh, the beer is still free, and we serve it to you. So you just have to sit there and get your glass full up. What we're about to do right now is taste seven of the beers from all of the champion breweries from last year. So if you don't know, the way the competition works is to become a champion brewery in your field, you have to have won the most points in the competition. And we have uh, uh, the best small brewery, the best small uh, brew pub, there's a mid-sized brewery, there's large brewery, there's all these different categories. So represented in front of you are the best of the best from 2011, and they brought you some of their beers to try. So you're in the right spot. My guess is that a bunch of these beers you might not even find out on the floor right now. So uh, welcome to the pavilion, and let's get started. We're going to go down the line and introduce you to everybody as we go, but we're just going to do it one beer at a time, and you should, be, uh, you should have a beer in your glass right now. And that beer is from uh, my friend Kevin DeLang here from Dry Dock, and uh, he's brought you a beer. Uh, what champion uh, medal did you guys win, Kevin? Uh, the, for the Hefeweizen last year, we got a gold in the South German Hefeweizen category. And then we were also lucky enough in 2009, 2010 to get silver with this beer. So we've been three years in a row, it's, it's medaled. So we've been pretty excited about that. And I think every one of these guys would attest to win one medal in the GABF is a difficult task. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of beers entered. To win several medals in one year is an enormous feat. So you guys were really putting in some quality beer. Yeah, it's been difficult, though, because the last few years in 9, 10, and 11, we've had a lot of success. And so on the one hand, we've really enjoyed that, but then people start to expect it. And I've already heard tonight over and over, it's like, well, good luck. Hopefully you win lots of medals. And to be honest with you, every year we go in hoping to get one bronze. It's like we'll be happy with one bronze medal because it is so difficult. You can have a beer that, that has performed in the past and is is really good and we think it has a shot, but there's also an, at least another 15 or 20 beers in that category that are also good. And just getting to the second round in the, in the judging process and, and getting to that point where, where they're trying to pick gold, silver, bronze, all the beers they're looking at, whether it's, it's 10 or 20 beers, are all really good. And so it's super difficult. Um, and so we, are, we always feel super lucky whenever we get a medal. If you've ever been to the awards ceremony and you see the celebrating that goes on among the breweries when they get a medal, I mean, it's like you just won the World Series. And that's really why, because you understand how difficult and all of the beers that you had to defeat to get to that point. So Exactly. And, and it doesn't matter. Like I said, it, you know you have good beers in there, but there are so many other good beers that, that it is really difficult. And so it's, it's always a, a joy when you get one, for sure. Well, tell us about this beer. Um, so it's a South German style Hefeweizen. Uh, it's very light, kind of fluffy, uh, German style wheat beer. Unfiltered, obviously, it's very cloudy. Uh, the biggest part of this beer, most of the flavor is coming from the yeast. That's really the key to the beer. And so it's about 55% wheat, and the rest is uh, a German Pilsner and, and some Munich, but it, it's all about the yeast. We only use this yeast once. Uh, every time we, we do a batch, we grow it up from scratch, from a slant, we, we don't repitch it. And we pitch a very small amount to stress out the yeast. Okay. And normally you don't want to stress out yeast, but in this case, when we don't pitch very much yeast, it produces a lot of those banana esters and, and phenols that we're looking for. And so it's, it's one of our favorite beers. It's the one we've, we've won the most medals with, but it's also the most difficult to, to reproduce every time for us, for sure. So. I would encourage anybody up here, too, as you're tasting any of these beers, if you have comments or questions to help us along, I think we would all trust your palates. So feel free. And same with you guys out there. If you've got any questions, we'll get a microphone around to you. So stressing out the yeast uh, is pulling out some of the uh, banana and clove that I'm tasting in this exactly. beer. Exactly, and it varies a lot. I mean, uh, the cell count is super important with, with most of our beers for sure, but in this one, it's really critical. And how much oxygen we put in it, we tend to under-oxygenate it and under-pitch the yeast on purpose. To, and it takes about, normally our, our beer's fermenting very quickly, but this one's a good, it has a lag time of at least 24, 36 hours before it starts producing any carbon dioxide and it really starts fermenting. And, and so that's what produces a lot of those, those flavors we're looking for. 
So in general, kind of just so we can understand, the opposite would be to, to pitch the correct amount of yeast at the right temperatures and, and put enough oxygen in there so that the yeast are so happy that the beer comes out clean and, and easy. And it would still have those flavors. It would still have some of the banana esters. It would still have just a, a hint of clove, but they would be much more subdued, okay. for sure. If we did our normal oxygen and pitch rates with this beer, it wouldn't taste nearly the same. And, uh, and there's a lot of wheat malt in a beer like this? There is quite a bit of wheat malt and uh, the Pilsner malt, and, and the wheat kind of gives it that nice, fluffy, kind of creamy body to it. And then most of the flavor, though, is coming from the yeast for sure. Very little hot bitterness, but. Question. Is, it, is it Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you do anything to control the amount of yeast that goes into your package as far as yeast cell counts or anything like that? Um, in case you didn't hear it, he was asking about how much yeast we do in the package. Right now, we're, we're fairly small still. We are uh, bottling on a, on a little six head mahin. We're only in about 100 liquor stores in the Denver metro area. And, and so we, we haven't had to yet. The good news is it's moving so quickly that typically we'll get it into the bottle when we have about that right, that right yeast. But with this yeast, it will continue to flocculate, which means it settles out in the glass. All yeast over time wants to fall to the bottom of the bottle or the glass. And so we put on the bottle to, to please rouse the bottle because there is some yeast on the bottom. And it does taste differently. And you might actually have one as they're pouring them. If you got the first pour, it'd be a little clearer than the person who had the last one. And so that's our biggest challenge, is even with kegs that we send out to accounts. We've seen some other breweries that will store the kegs with these types of beers uh, upside down and ship them upside down. And then when they get to the bar or restaurant, they come back right side up to get the yeast back into solution. And so um, as we work on our expansion, we're working on a much larger brewery and hope to be brewing there in the next month or so. It's going to become more of an issue for us. We'll be putting this in cans and distributing it. And we're going to have a little less control over it as the beer travels a little bit farther and it might be on the shelf a little longer than two weeks. Uh, and so that's going to be a continual challenge for us and making sure that the beer or the yeast stays roused up in the beer for sure. This is an excellent beer to put in cans. I think that's a great choice. It should be good. A nice, nice, nice light, refreshing, good summer beer for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, congratulations on 2011. I have to assume you've entered beers into this year as well. Yep, we have. And this one, after uh, getting lucky enough the last three years, where uh, we definitely entered this one again for All sure. Right, good. Well, good luck this year. Thank you. All right, let's meet Zambo here. Yeah, don't be afraid to applause. These guys are great. And that's a wonderful beer. Zambo here right. is from the 21st Amendment Brewery in San Francisco, near where I live. It's one of my local breweries uh, that I've been a fan of for a long time. And I'm sure that Zambo won't mind when I say congratulations to the San Francisco Giants for winning our division today. Yes. And if you don't like it, I could care less. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're actually two and a half blocks from the stadium, so we're, uh, they're, they're our neighbors. We very much want them to do well, believe me. It's not a uh, let's make bets and drink and see who's going to win thing. It's these are our buddies. They come to our bar. They drink with us. And... Uh, Kudos to them for uh, making history by being the first team to ever do what they did today. So Yeah, coming back from two-game yeah. deficit was awesome. Right. So 21st Amendment must have been packed and celebrating today. Even though it wasn't a home game, uh, you guys are so close to the park, I'm sure it was busy. I heard rumors. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, working. <laughs> right. Uh, I did watch it, uh, thankfully, uh, and we did order a lot of extra beer for the weekend. So uh, I think they'll be ready. I think. Now, what beer did you win with in 2011, Zambo? Uh, this is uh, one of our gold medals from last year, Amber Waves. This is uh, American Amber Ale. So this is a little bit more of a mainstream style from some of the wild stuff you're going to have out here with this and that that you haven't heard of grown on some tree or root somewhere. But uh, it's, uh, I'm very proud that this is my, one of my first gold medals at GABF because uh, this kind of beer you'll do a hundred times and never be happy with yourself. You'll redo it, you'll change it just a tiny bit every, every single time you do it. But I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm very proud of this beer. It's done a great job. I think the American Amber is kind of a misunderstood style. Every time I recommend it at our bar, everyone says, I'm not into Ambers, they're too sweet. And I think that's because people aren't really doing the American Amber. I think they're still tying to some of the European red beers and things like that that are maltier. And it should have some malt presence to it, but American Amber is really, if you look at the numbers, if you're a brewer and you look at the, the actual stats compared to a pale ale, 
they're almost the same beer, except for the color. And then you read the description, and there needs to be more malt flavor and everything. So basically, when you're designing it, don't leave out the hops, you know? Make sure they're in there. Just make sure you substitute some of your base malt for some flavored color malts, like Munich malts, Vienna, things that'll, you know, give the amber color in there, but not turn it into something super sweet or super malty that should be considered, you know, a very different beer. The hops need to be there. Uh, this beer is finished with Centennial hops. It's got Centennial in the middle. The only other hop in it is Chinook in the beginning, which is a nice piney American hop. But uh, the hops really come out nicely unless you do what I did and you have something else first. So this was my second beer of the night when I first got to my booth, and I'm like, whoa, what did I do wrong here? And when I left the pub about a month ago, I said this was my best batch of Amber Waves yet. So remember, when you're trying all these crazy wild beers out there, Try those after you try the old mainstream ones that you already know in your head real well because you're going to kind of dumb out some of the flavors and, you know, you're not really going to do it justice. And if you're here to have a good time, go for the experimental beers, you know. Do what makes you happy. That's why we make beer. You're the ones that give us a job. But do it in the tasting order if you want to appreciate it the way we do. You can tell Zambo's uh, from hippie San Francisco. Just, just do whatever makes you happy, man. We don't care. We love beer. <laughs> But I think you bring up an excellent point uh, because a lot of people say, well, you know, an amber ale, I don't know, what's the difference between that and a pale ale and it doesn't have a lot of flavor. But it very well might be that it's because we're used to these uh, much heavier beers, much hoppier beers. Uh, maybe we've tasted something first, like you said, and our palate really isn't picking up on the nuances of the beer. I'm a huge fan of a nice, even-keeled American pale ale and, a, in my opinion, even more difficult to find a good amber ale. Because if, you, if your palate is ready for it, you can really pick out a ton of different flavor in it. Um, but what is kind of the hop threshold between an American pale ale and an American amber ale? Well, honestly, the IBUs come out the same. The, this Amber Waves is 30 IBUs. My Five South Pale Ale is 30 IBUs, and that got uh, Blue Ribbon at the California State Fair. There's some pretty good pale ales in California. So same IBUs for an amber and a pale, uh, but you can definitely pull out more malt flavor from the amber because of the malt we use. There's five different caramel malts. There's some Caram Munich, some American malts. There's, uh, of course, Munich malts I've mentioned. And the pale ales, at least California pale ales, which we're trying to redefine the entire globe with, are drier than, of course, the original English and even the American ones that came before. Well, nothing came before Sierra Nevada, did it? But uh, this, the pale ales you're getting now are even drier than Sierra Nevada. And Sierra Nevada is a great uh, staple, uh, you know, and the yeast that uh, almost, uh, well, a lot of craft brewers are using in the country, we call California ale yeast, but uh, it's what most of us are using. We're using the same darn yeast. So uh, you really can control all of this with recipe development and uh, how you brew the beer. You know, don't, don't forget, you know, take some liberties, make it your own beer. But don't forget what your customers are looking for because those are the people that make you what you are. So have fun with it and uh, do some experimental beers, but do some straightforward beers too. Take them to your friends, share them. Uh, also, I want to mention one more quick thing uh, on bottling. I consider myself very lucky to have gotten medals. And I've convinced, I've told all the owners, I, I, one of them just walked in. We have, this is the first year we have a 10 beer limit. I am aiming for 10 fourth place beers this year. I will have absolutely no idea actually how we did as long as I have that in my head because when we sent those beers out, I was, very, I was standing around the bar talking to our, our customers who are the people we brew for and we all really were extremely happy with the beers, some of the best we ever made. So uh, that's the bottom line, you know, do that. Make them right. But uh, bottling is uh, a separate skill in itself. So don't ever uh, get upset if you don't score in competitions because of the way your bottling went or anything like that. Just go hang out with some people that have done well with bottling and learn the tricks. There's just a couple things you can do. But uh, compete. It'll make you a better brewer. Don't be afraid to get fourth place. Ten fourth place this year. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Thank you very much. I love much. it. It's another good point Zabo makes. It used to be that you could enter uh, as many beers as you wanted, I think. And, and for some, you know, you do that just because you're interested in competing. In other ways, you're kind of stacking the deck. The more beers you have in the competition, the better chance you have to win. So to even the playing field a little bit, they did that 10-beer that cap. 
And I, too, am rooting for 10 fourth place for you. Maybe one third place and then nine fourth place, Zambo. <laughs> I think All right, right good. on. Thanks. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to Don Spencer, who's from Silver City uh, Brewery. And uh, yeah, you can use mine. Or use Zambo's. There you go. Hello, yeah. There we go. Happy to be here. <laughs> Where's Silver City Brewery? Uh, we are located in Bremerton, Washington. Okay. We are west of Seattle across uh, Puget Sound. It's beautiful. Got it. And what did you win last year? Last year, we won a gold medal uh, in the classic English pale ale category for our Clear Creek Pale Ale. Beautiful. So uh, there are some similarities, as uh, Zambo mentioned, between uh, pale ales and uh, the American amber ales. This is a British style, so it's a little more tart. Uh, it's drier. It's got not the malt base that um, you would find in an American amber ale. And, it, and the hops are uh, subdued, I'd say, a bit. Yeah, yeah I'd say they're, they're pretty subdued, too. It does have a lot of malt characteristics of the amber. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, the neat thing with this beer is, as I have to mention, this is the first beer I brewed 16 years ago when we opened Silver City Brewery. This is the first brew day that we had was this beer. Okay. Now, the way this beer evolved from that day to this um, are small changes, but very significant in the overall how this beer is today because of the changes that you make slowly along the way. And part of that is because of not winning medals at JBF, getting judge slips back and using those as a source. They're just, they're one source of uh, feedback that you get. Of course, the largest source is your consumers, your, your guests that come in and drink your beer. But you don't want to give them too much, weight, too much weight, but you do want to give them the weight they deserve. You also have to have faith in yourself and your own uh, judge in the beer and, and what your vision is. But this beer has evolved um, through those different processes. It has some British malt in that, which gives it a nice biscuit, bready note in there. Um, the hops are, are there. Again, 30 IBUs. Uh, so it's, it's crisp and very drinkable. And I, and I have to agree with uh, Zambo here. A lot of people ignore those mainstream beers, um, but they're hard to do, you know, to get that balance um, that you're looking for, for drinkability, you know. So I'm very proud of this beer, absolutely. Were you a home brewer before you were a pro? Yes. You were afraid to say that for a uh, second. No, no it just, um, <laughs> I started home brewing when I was 14. Okay, <laughs> right. Thank I you, was, Mom. I was popular in school. Yeah, you were. In junior high school, you were super popular. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not a, you know, any different than a lot of, you know. Like, yeah. Like Zambo just said, he was 19, so. Um, <laughs> right. You get the calling, you know. You, 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 you fall in love with the process, and not just the beer, but, you know, the, the creation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one of the reasons I ask is that I'm also a home brewer, and I already mentioned that one of my favorite uh, styles is a pale ale, an American pale ale. And every time I brew, which isn't very often, I try to brew a pale ale. And it's because I've been trying to perfect a pale ale for about eight years now. I still haven't done it. I'm, I'm a pretty shitty brewer, to be honest. But I keep trying because I think it's a delicate beer, and it's hard to do. You know, there, there are other beers that you can kind of cover up a lot of flaws with, with hops. You can even cover them up with malt. Sure. But a balanced pale ale is extremely difficult. And... A lot of people also make them. It's one of the busiest categories in the, in the award ceremony, too. That's right. Yeah. So I think to do it, I, I, you said you've been brewing this beer for 14 years? Six, 16 years. Yeah. 16 years. Yeah. Now, now, Silver City started as a brew pub. A little history here. Uh, in Silverdale, that's how we get the name Silver City. And that's about 10 minutes north uh, of uh, Bremerton. Uh, about two years ago, we decided to uh, become a production brewery. So... Um, those years that I spent in the brew pub, uh, you have a lot of freedom, and you're able to and you get a lot of feedback from the guests. In a production brewery, things start to get a little bit more regimented, and you kind of have to fall in. Luckily, we have our, our beers are starting to really get dialed in to where I want them. So. And then, as you mentioned, each judge actually fills out a sheet on your beer when you entered into competition, oh, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you can't, you can't be oversensitive on this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but so many brewers really are. But um, 
again, you can't give them too much weight. You have to have faith in yourself and be able to recognize those comments that you can say, well, this person just didn't get what I was trying to do. Yeah. And they don't know what they're talking about in this situation. And so I'm just going to ignore it and move on because, you know, I don't want my beer to taste like somebody else's particularly. I don't, sure. it's my vision. It's not anybody else's. Yeah. How many brewers and home brewers do we have in the audience? And how many of you have entered your beers in competitions and gotten that feedback? Yeah. And how many of you have read through those notes and gone, oh, that's bullshit? <laughs> yeah. Well, pro brewers do it too, uh, but you still do have to be open-minded. If you get five sheets and four out of the five sheets are kind of similar, then you can throw out that fifth, like, wackadoo who said he tasted onions in your beer and it wasn't there, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I said, they're... That is, you know, it's not all about winning medals. It is. But, you know, um, this is my 15th Great American Beer Festival. And we didn't win medals for, uh, for a long time. And so you, you kind of have to suck it up and learn from it and get the value out of it from those judging slips. Well, you, you know, you are putting your beer out to the public. That's what you do. And I really enjoy it when brewers like you uh, appreciate the feedback and, and listen to it. And I know a lot of brewers say, oh, well, we all do that. But I've also, it, because it's difficult, it's your baby. It's your product. You've kind of slaved over it. It is sometimes hard to hear that criticism. But all the best beers I've had, and certainly the medal-winning beers, have your philosophy, where you really listen to as much input as you can. So, absolutely. Thanks for brewing great beer. Thanks. <laughs> all right, let's talk, uh, talk to Jeff Doyle, who's from Odell. And uh, being from the West Coast, I just discovered Odell when I started coming to the GABF about six years ago or something, and a friend of mine lives near you and took me over there, and I've always been impressed. It's one of the first beers I go to when I come to Colorado. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you guys are doing great stuff over there. Uh, we pour our heart and soul into this stuff. <laughs> so what beers uh, did you win with last year? Uh, just the Freak was our only, our only solid medal. Um, but it's one we're really proud of. It's the most collaborative beer that we've ever done in the brewery. Uh, we used about 600 pounds of... Uh, Fort Collins raspberries that were all harvested by hand by Odell employees, friends and family. Uh, tons of fun, and there's, there's plenty of age in this. Uh, we've been working on it for quite some time. It was actually uh, a happy accident. Um, we had a creek that we'd been aging for quite some time, and we had a whole bunch of raspberries that we had mixed into some Easy Street, and we were playing around one day, blended the two of them together, and it really seemed to work. And uh, no coincidence that Frambois and Creek together make a freak. So we rolled with that. It's an awesome beer. Thank you so much. I'm a huge sour beer fan, and it, so if it makes me pucker and like my eyes squint in a stupid face, that's a good beer. Yeah, just yeah. enough though. Uh, subtlety is key. It has to be balanced and drinkable. It, we don't want to make novelties. We're not, uh, we're not trying to blow out our interpretation. So a beer like this, and you mentioned has some age. Uh, how old is this beer in particular? Uh, there were barrels in here that were four or five years old. Uh, we'll pull a little bit out of them and then refill those barrels and let them continue those cultures and have them for year after year. Okay. So we've been able to continue to make this stuff with a, a relative consistency and a whole lot of fun. That's kind of the uh, original Belgian way to do it, too, isn't it? To have one-year-old fresh beer that you blend with beer that's been around for several years? Yeah, that's... Uh, we tried to take as many of the finer points as we could. You know, we, obviously we can't make a lambic, but uh, right. we, can, we, can learn, we can learn from their hundreds of years of experience. Sure. So one problem that beer has in, in aging is oxidation. And especially if it's sitting in barrels and even when it's in the bottle sometimes, it's a problem we have with age, which I don't taste in this beer. So how do you guys keep it fresh and keep oxygen out for that long? Uh, Bottle conditioning has a lot to do with it. Uh, also, the barrel aging process. We have uh, there's some lactobacillus, some Britannomyces, some other wild wild yeasts that are involved. So they're scavenging oxygen all the time. Living organisms need oxygen to survive. So they chew it up out of there and uh, bring a little bit of tartness that would kind of pull pull away from that that uh, dried fruit flavor. Is this available in, in bottles now to, for people to buy? We've been sold out for a little while, so this is the only Freak available. We're not pouring Freak anywhere else oh, this weekend. Oh, cheers to that. Uh, yeah. We'll be bringing it back. We've got another batch coming out, I believe, end of October. Okay. If you're just coming in, we're talking to the champion brewers from 2011 who are sharing seven of their beers with us today, and we're just going down the line. If you've got questions, 
Raise your hand. When I look out that way, I'll try to get you a microphone. Mr. Sean O'Sullivan, also from the 21st Amendment, has a question. I just have a question for Zambo. Uh, you said you're looking forward to winning 10 fourth place medals. Y your review is coming up. We'll talk about this when we get home. Thank you, Sully. <laughs> All right. Any questions about this beer? Are we, do we have sour beer fans in the audience? It's not for everybody, I know, but I like that. More and more people are getting into the style and loving it. It's such a unique style of beer. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a whole lot of fun. It's kind of dangerous, too. Uh, You've got to love a little bit of danger. You can't risk infection. But, uh, right. yeah, we, we like to keep balance, too. It's not too fruity and sweet. It doesn't have the cough medicine thickness, and uh, <laughs> it's not overbearingly tart. So are you guys still uh, hand-picking 600 pounds of raspberries then every year as you no, I, release uh, it I again? Don't, I, don't know, uh, I don't know if that's going to be sustainable. <laughs> that's got to be the, the hard part. Yeah, we got an expansion coming up. That's going to exactly. that's gonna take a little bit more than we got. How many people were doing the hand-picking of these raspberries? Uh, it, was, it was a small army, and we had, uh, we had friends and wives and children involved. Child, child labor is delicious. <laughs> Now, maybe this is a dumb question, but there are easier ways to get a, a raspberry into a beer like this. There are purees and extracts and things like that. Why did you guys choose the, the fresh fruit? Uh, actually, we had the source. That was part of the happy accident. Uh, we had a whole ton of raspberries, and that's why we were playing with the Easy Street Wheat. Um, it's our bottle line manager's sister-in-law has a couple of acres of raspberries, and so we thought we'd put them to use, make some alcohol. Nice. Just happen to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How many pounds per barrel? How many pounds of fruit per barrel? Uh, that, that comes out total to about nine pounds per barrel. Okay. Uh, the cherries go in during fermentation, so they get chewed through pretty well. Uh, raspberries go in later, later in the process. Uh, we use cherry puree. Got it. And then just real quick to clarify, you kind of said that it, it can be dangerous to produce a beer like this in your brewery. And I think you mean if you're also producing clean beer that doesn't... Have, so can you just explain that a little bit for those of us who don't brew? Uh, yeah, yeah. This, uh, this technically is a flawed beer. Uh, it's dirty, filthy beer. Um, it's got lactobacillus, Britannomyces, some other wild, uh, wild yeast strains. Um, in, this case, uh, in this case, it's a rose garden. Uh, in a lot of other cases, it would be a, a carrot in a rose garden, which is still a weed. So... Um, if, if that carries over, if, if you're not absolutely clean, if you don't have dedicated equipment to make your sour beer with, then you can infect your entire brewery and, and it's really tough to come back from. <laughs> so do you just use yeast or yeast that's wild in Fort Collins or do you introduce those yeasts? Uh, uh, I would say 60% of the wild yeast that we have in the Freak are uh, our local Tewa. Uh, some of them came in from bourbon barrels and um, some of it's Britannomyces that we've had cultured from here and there. I have a, I heard um, a Scott Vaccaro from Captain Lawrence, we interviewed him once, and he had a winery next to his brewery at the time. And the vintner refused to walk into Scott's brewery because he was using wild yeast and Britannomyces and things like that, which is the enemy of wine. And the, he was a friend of his, and he literally wouldn't even step foot in the brewery for fear that it would get on his clothes and then into his wine barrels. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's really dangerous, but really good, so worth the gamble. Good for brewers, bad for, for wineries. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you sharing this beer, man. Thank you so much. The last of it, that's awesome. All right, let's talk to uh, Alex Violet, uh, who's from Upslope. Alex, did I get your last name right? Is it Violet? No, you got it right. I did. All right, beautiful. Uh, Alex from Upslope. And uh, what medal did you win, Alex? Uh, we won the uh, Field and Pumpkin Beer medal. Yes, Field and Pumpkin Beer. So I think third place was actually a beet beer. So any sort of vegetable, we use pumpkins. So it's our uh, Halloween beer. It's a good time of year for it again. Oh, yeah. It's, um, it's definitely a very seasonal beer for us. Um, like the Freak, it's also very collaborative and very local. We use um, nothing but local, organically grown pumpkins in this beer. So we think that's one of the things that really makes this beer stand out in the category and really have some flavors that we like to keep in this brew. Hold your microphone just a little closer so we can... Yeah, there you go. 
Yeah, so local or organic pumpkins, and, and in what form do they go in the beer? What do you do with the pumpkins? Okay, so with the pumpkins, we actually go out to the farm, and uh, we went the first year that we did it, and we got every single type of pumpkin that they grew on this farm, and we took them back to our houses. We cooked them in our ovens and tasted them and just ate the pumpkin and said, which one of these guys tastes the best just by itself, and that's the one that we wanted to use in the beer. So um, from then on, we... Uh, we were kind of tied to doing it in our ovens. So we've been baking it in our pumpkin, like the pumpkin meat in our ovens for the first two years that we did this beer. Uh, this most recent year, we have it released in a can and we were uh, forced to move to a commercial kitchen, but you know, the spirit of baking it in our houses is still in this beer, I think. And why do you have to bake it uh, instead of the raw pumpkin? Um, because we like to caramelize the uh, sugars and the starches that are in those pumpkins to give a residual sweetness that kind of comes through. Um, I think it's a very unique residual sweetness that kind of um, sticks to your lips, makes them sticky, but not overly um, cloying. And what was the kind of pumpkin, by the way, I didn't even know there were different kinds of pumpkins, but what was the kind of pumpkin that you ended up deciding was the best? Um, it was a pie pumpkin. It's a uh, baby bear pie pumpkin from Munson Farms in Boulder, Colorado. You have baby bear pie pumpkin fans here. I had no idea there was yeah. a fan club for those. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I like that you've canned it also, and you guys went with the Tall Boy can, which I'm also a fan of. Yeah, this is our first pint can, and we're really happy that our gold medal, it's our only gold medal winning beer, and uh, we're really happy to be able to put it in that big pint can, awesome bronze can you saw it coming around, so really proud of that as well. It's very cool. We think the can is a great package for the beer. It's really great, protects it from light, protects it from oxygen, so... And what about other spices? Did, did you add anything else besides the pumpkin to this beer? Yeah, we added a custom spice blend that I worked with uh, Dan Hayward from Savory Spice Shop on. So I actually went into his shop and um, tried all the different varieties of the spices. So we're not just using a certain type of cinnamon. We're using a cinnamon from a certain region and all the way down to that. And we wanted to blend it so that it would uh, emulate that pumpkin pie flavor, but not be overly astringent. We didn't want to get any astringency from these spices. So we minimized our use of certain things like nutmeg and substituted those for things like blade mace that have similar flavors but don't lend that astringency. I think you made good choices on that. That's another difficult thing to do if you end up with too much allspice or, like you mentioned, nutmeg can take over a beer quickly. And pretty soon it doesn't taste like a beer at all. It tastes like pumpkin pie, which some people appreciate, but I'd rather it taste like a beer with pumpkin in it That instead. is exactly what I was going for on this beer with said it multiple times, this was a beer first. Um, we wanted it to taste like a beer, drink like a beer, not be cloyingly sweet or overly spiced. So I'm really happy with the way it turned out this year. I was kind of nervous about having the uh, pumpkins baked in a commercial kitchen for the first time, but I uh, went in there, trained the staff, and it seemed to work out pretty well. Is he a friend or is he just a fan of everything? A fan of commercial He's kitchens? He's a good friend. His name is Brian Patterson. Um, <laughs> he was our pro-am brewer. Okay. Oh, cool. Three years ago when we won a bronze medal with his Belgian pale ale. So. Nice. <laughs> Congratulations. I, also I just, I just thought he first... was the friends of inanimate objects guy. I also believe one of the uh, first pumpkin baking sessions happened in his kitchen, did it not? Okay. Did you have to do a, a lot of small experimental batches before figuring out the spice blend? Definitely. Um, I had never brewed a pumpkin beer before. So first off, adding the pumpkins. We decided to go in the mash. We wanted the alcohol in the beer to be directly from the pumpkins themselves. We didn't want to add it as a flavoring. We wanted to add it as actually part of the beer. And then the spices. Um, we got pumpkin pie spice packs. And we spiced probably five to 10 different batches of our pumpkin pie wort with these different ones. And we found that every single one of them came out too astringent. And that's when we decided to go to Dan and make that custom blend. It came out great. It's a wonderful beer. Well, you guys thank like you. the pumpkin beer? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Did you enter it again this year? Sure did. You did. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you so much. Did you enter other beers also? Yes, we did. We did. Um, our Belgian Pale Ale is now one of our year-round beers. We entered that. Um, we did our craft lager our barley wine, brown ale, we have a double IPA, rye IPA. We did quite a few. We maxed out the, uh, the 10 beer limit, except for our wit beer was not ready in time. So uh, okay. didn't get submitted this year. That seems to be the theme I'm hearing from brewers this year. I don't know that I've talked to one yet who didn't enter 10 beers. 
So competition is going to be difficult. And I don't want to hear any pissing and moaning about, well, they entered more beers than I did, because it's all even with you guys now. So I like it. Well, thank you very much, Alex. I appreciate well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. All right. Uh, let's go on to Trogue's Brewing Company, and we've got Tris, uh, Chris Trogner here with us. Uh, Chris, what beer do you have to share with us? We're, uh, today we're going to sample our Troganator Double Bach. Troganator? Is that what you Troganator, yes. Oh, Troganator, got it. And if I could just say uh, to everybody who's going to taste this beer, if it tastes like pumpkin, it's not, it's not Trogue's fault. There's still pumpkin left in your glass, so you might try to get every last drop out of your glass before we... Yeah, give me a rinse. <laughs> so what can you tell us about this beer? Last year we won the gold medal in the, in the German-style Bach category. Uh, and the Troganator for us has been... has kind of turned into a signature beer for our brewery. And we kind of feel that we're on the cusp of a, of a Bach and a double Bach, meaning that it's, you know, alcohol-wise, we're kind of pushing the limits at 8%. The malt we're using, 40% Munich malt, is very delicate, very soft, so it almost has kind of the appearance or the taste of a Bach, but it has the strength of a double Bach. But it doesn't, it doesn't have hot alcohol flavors like, like some a double Bach might. It's a very even-keeled beer. It should be very delicately smooth, so the alcohol is not something you should notice. It, it's definitely aged out very well. Uh, I think you can, you, you're not, well, you're gonna smell as much more caramel, more bread, more toast. I also think it dried out pretty well. And, and so there's not a lot of, uh, it's certainly, there's sweetness, but not a ton of residual. Yeah, I think with, with any kind of Bach or double Bach, you're gonna have a, some level of residual sweetness, but this beer ferments down very low so it does have that dryness. So I think that's gonna help uh, not have that cloyingly sweetness that's gonna linger for a long time, which a lot of the big, rich, kind of licorice-y double box do have. What is the alcohol content of this beer, do you know? Troganator's 8.2. So it's a pretty big beer, but again, it, it comes through really nice. Yep. It does have some of the grape uh, flavors that you're talking about, some of the uh, just that rich malt that you get out of a big Bach beer like that. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of want to drink a whole bottle and see how the rest of this <laughs> interview goes. <laughs> At 8%. Yeah. I love this beer. Now, did you guys uh, enter this again this year? We did. Um, we're, we're wishing for the best again. The Troganators actually captured um, a couple different medals at the JBF and uh, the World Beer Cup. And did you enter a lot of other beers as well? We entered... I think five or six different beers this year. Where are you guys located? We're in central Pennsylvania. We, uh, our original brewery was in Harrisburg. We just opened up a new location in Hershey. So you guys are ex expanding quite a bit. We're adding a lot more stainless steel like a lot of other breweries. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing this beer. I think it's awesome. You I'm bet. a big fan yep. of Bach Thank beers. You. Can you tell us, do you, do you know what a, uh, the, the mascot of the Bach beer is? And is there one on your label? And is there one on your label? What is a Bach in German? What is a Bach? It's a goat, right? Yeah. Isn't it a goat? Do you guys have a goat? Well, our, our label's a half man, half goat. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. I just want a half it's man, half, half goat beer label. Right. It's kind of after a few pints, that's what some people turn into. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you know me well. Did the label? <laughs> Well, thank you, Chris. Yep, thank you. All right, let's talk to Smutty Nose. We got JT Thompson from Smutty Nose here with us. Yeah, some Smutty Nose fans. Where are you guys located? We're in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, about an hour north of Boston and about 45 minutes south of Portland, right on the coast. Got it. At the end of New Hampshire. And what beer are you sharing with us today? Uh, this is our Wheat Wine Ale. Uh, oh, yeah. It's part of our big beer series, and it's won two gold medals at GABF, uh, both in the other strong... Well, in 2005, it was the other strong beer category, and in 2011, it was uh, the other strong ale category. So. so there's no wheat wine category. You have to compete against several styles in that. Yeah, there are a couple of sub-styles in the category, and one of them is wheat wine style ale. I see. Um, and, and it is important to note that uh, the name of the beer doesn't have style in it. We actually had to delay the first year of this beer uh, for about six months. We were in a label dispute with the federal government 
Um, there's no reason to put the word style in there. And, uh, and we wanted to just call it wheat wine. And uh, the compromise was wheat wine ale. So I see. We got rid of the dash and the style. Yeah, I don't understand what the problem would be with, with, with doing that. Uh, well, the best part was uh, they, they said there's no beer called a wheat wine. And, and, and we said, well, we just brewed this. And <laughs> they said, well, you can't create a beer style. And it's like, well, if, if we can't create a new beer style as a brewery, like, who's going to a potato right. chip company? So. I love that the all-knowing control board told you that there's no beer like that while there was a beer in your hand like that. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> no, sir, that doesn't ironic. exist. But it does exist. <laughs> I'm drinking it. And we made it, yeah. <laughs> um, so you had to add the, the ale to the end of it. That's what yeah, you said? Yeah, that, that, that was the compromise. Well, that's, but that makes all the sense in the world to me. So I don't, I don't know why you didn't do that at the beginning. <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to ask them. Right. So I haven't had a lot of wheat wine. I have had a couple, though. Tell us a little bit about what a wheat wine is to you. Uh, I think uh, you're right. It's, it's still a pretty nebulous category. I think there are some wheat wines that are brewed with hefeweizen yeast, and it's still pretty nebulous. Our, our take was basically uh, to brew a, a big barley wine, but to drop out a lot of the caramel malt character. I think when you taste this beer, you'll see it's not really caramelly, really chewy, and really sweet. Um, 47% of the grain bill is a blend of different types of wheat malt, and it actually lightens up the body a little bit. I think it's a little more drinkable. Um, it's big. It's, uh, th this, this batch was 11.98%. So That's um, very big. Yeah, and it, I, I don't think it drinks like it. I think we do a pretty good job of hiding alcohol in our big beers. So. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot like Chris's beer, which, which obviously isn't, isn't quite that big, yeah. I think this beer really does hide the alcohol the same way. It's a very smooth drinking beer. Yeah, if you, uh, if you stop by our booth, I-13, by the way, uh, we've got a couple of big beers up, and, and they're all pretty mellow on the alcohol side of things. Okay. I have had some wheat wines, and my biggest complaint about them is the high alcohol, and also I think there tends to be a lot of residual sweetness, and I don't like either one of those things together. This is probably the best one I've ever had. I can see why it, it, it won a medal. It doesn't have any of that. There's, there's sweetness in it, of course, but that high alcohol helps cut right through it. Yeah, we, uh, the, the beer gets prolonged aging. We, part of that is because we don't filter, and we don't even own a filter. So all of our beer is uh, it's flock and roll. We don't find our beers. We don't filter our beers. Um, and so for a beer like this, you know, it's a slow fermentation. We ferment it a little bit on the cool side, so we're not putting a lot of higher alcohols in the beer. Uh, so the fermentation's a little longer. It starts at about 25 Play-Doh, so there's a, there's a big buffet for the yeast to eat through. And then after that, we age it on uh, oak chips and dry hops for about a month before, we, before it goes off the packaging. So it's got a little bit of time on it before it hits the market. And uh, I think we released this batch. Uh, we do like nine big beers a year. Um, and this batch was released in January. So it's got, you know, what, 10 months on it at this point? So yeah, it's not, it's not right out of the tanks. And what kind of yeast for a big beer like this? Do you have to use something special? Uh, no, we just use our regular uh, Chico, the American ale yeast. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Same yeast a lot of people are using. I would have thought you needed something for the higher gravity, but you don't. No, this, our, our yeast rips through high gravity beers. It, it does a great job. Uh, it's the same strain Zambo was talking about, that California ale yeast. I mean, we use the White Labs version of it. I don't know if we're endorsing yeast companies here, but uh, it does a great job with big beers. And did you enter beer this year? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, we entered eight beers. We, we tend to sort of focus our GBF entering or GABF entering strategy on the minimum number of beers that it takes to win Brewery of the Year, uh, which is eight. I see. So uh, we saved a little bit of cash by not entering the last two beers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we, we've always kind of looked at this competition as sort of a crapshoot. You know, uh, we're, we're a little bit over capacity. We don't really have the ability to do a lot of like strategic brewing and, and tweaking of recipes. So uh, for most of the beers, we kind of grab the most recent bottles that we have and send them in. Um, we never expect to win anything, so when we do, it's a great thrill, and, and we're never too disappointed uh, if we don't. Uh, but it is fun to sit around the lunch table and read the scoring sheets. And, and you, you get, uh, you know, I, think, I think it's five tickets per beer, and two of them say, oh, this is a great example of the style, and then to say, this is a horrible example of the style. And, and it really gives you a good sense of context for, for how subjective it really is. Um, th this is all people's opinions and taste buds. And, and, and whether you're at your first beer festival or you've been judging for 15 years, 
it's all up to whatever you're tasting, so. I'm, I'm glad that you bring up the crapshoot part of it, because a lot of brewers, you know, we, we know that. But I think it, it's also important to note, you know, all of the beers that win a medal are amazing beers. That part's not a crapshoot. You don't make it all the way to the medal by not being an incredible good beer. But at the same time, the, the luck part of it is that occasionally in the first round, some equally incredible beers get thrown out by, by certain judges. And it just happens because, like you said, it's subjective. So, so equally incredible beers don't make it, you know, sometimes. But again, at the same time, to make it all the way through I enough rounds to win a medal, they're all world class. So, you know, I always recommend people to take some notes during the awards ceremony and go try those beers on the floor Saturday night, whatever's left of it, because they're guaranteed to be amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think there are very few sort of competition locks. Truganator, uh, they always, you know, Chris and John always win a lot of medals for that. Allagash White, and it seems like anything that Firestone Walker makes, they win medals for. But beyond that, everything else is pretty open-ended, I think, um, which and, is one of the it, great things about it. And I don't think it's a coincidence when, when these breweries like uh, Trugs win a, a bunch of medals like that. You can tell that consistently across the board of all their styles, they're really producing world-class beer. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, John and Chris gave me my, uh, my first production brewing job in Pennsylvania back in 2003, so I'm pretty biased, and, and I'm happy to give them a plug. But they make excellent beer, so... Absolutely. It doesn't surprise me at all. Right. Well, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming up here and sharing your beer with us. I really appreciate it. A round of applause for these guys. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, we can't get all these beers anymore, so it's really cool to sit here and do that. If there are any last questions, if I ignored you, then we're happy to take them. Uh, otherwise, we're about done in here for tonight. You can find all this on the Brewing Network. You can share it with your friends. If you're a fan of these breweries, you can send the video and uh, see them talking all on thebrewingnetwork.com. My name's Justin, and on behalf of these guys and everybody here at the Brewers Association, thanks for sitting down with us and hanging out. Cheers. The Brewing Network. <laughs>